hole in one. It's a hole in one. I got a hole in one. Marco. 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 Trustful. Well, whether you are joining us online or at one of our campuses, I want to say welcome. Thanks for carving out some time in your Labor Day weekend to connect with us today. My name's Roth in Bedford. I'm the director of our 6th through 8th grade ministry here at Grace called 678. And maybe you've had the opportunity to connect with me or my wife, Lamaru, before. We've attended Grace now for almost 10 years. I've been on staff now in my role for over five years. And the truth is, and I hope anyone who's ever interacted with me while I've been doing my job would say this is true, I love my job. I love getting to work with the students here at Grace. And one of the things that I love to be able to do is to teach them biblical truth from the authority of scripture. And I am excited to be able to do that today. But I'm not in 678. I'm with us. And so I am excited to teach us biblical truth from the authority of scripture. And to do that in the second week of this squad series that we're in. And I think it's important as we start this out that we get a reminder of what we're talking about when we say squad. Because when we say squad, we're not talking about that neighbor you wave to when you take the trash out, but you're still not quite sure what their name is. We're not talking about that relative that sometimes shows up at holidays or even those people in the office that you make small talk with as you're waiting for the meeting to start. That's not your squad. In fact, we said it this way, that your squad, they're the people you're doing life with that are shaping you and that you are shaping. We said it last week, we're saying it again this week, that your squad is the people you're doing life with that are shaping you and that you are shaping. These are the people you want to hang out with. These are the people that you call over to have for dinner. You have game nights. You might even go on vacation with them. This is your squad. And we said that in this series, we have a couple of goals, that our goals would be this, that we would examine our squad and we'd examine what type of member of the squad that we are. That our goals for this series would be to examine the squad and examine what type of member of the squad that you are. And so if you missed last week, I wanna encourage you, find some time this week to go online, find the message and give it a listen. Pastor Keith did an incredible job setting up uh, this whole series and talking about how we were designed for community and how our friends can really be a gift from God. And we're gonna continue to talk about that community, friends, our squad today. I, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I had a group of guys and we did everything together, right? We were the boys. And on any given weekend, we would all be together. And, and here's what I know is true. Individually, us that made up this group, you would look at us and you would say, oh, they, they're kind, helpful, mature, maybe even you would say responsible young men. And then we would get together and we became morons. And I don't know why that happened. I don't understand the science behind it, but it was true. When we got together, we did dumb things. I regularly, this is not even a joke, I regularly thank God that ring doorbells were not a thing when I was growing up. <laughs> because I know my friends and I would have been blasted on a couple of community Facebook pages, guaranteed. I can remember this time, I'm uh, hanging out in my basement, all the boys are there. Two o'clock in the morning, middle of July, my friend Keegan turns to the group and he says, let's do something stupid. <laughs> Important for us to know um, that what we would say is stupid, my friends and I, that would have just been normal. For us to call something stupid, yeah, we knew we were in for a treat. Yeah, we knew that what we were about to do would one day become a story. So my friend, I remember my friend Keegan said, let's do something stupid. We, without hesitation, got up, went to the hall closet, put on snowsuits, middle of July, might I remind you? And we went out to my neighborhood looking for something stupid to do. And we come across this house that's throwing out four mattresses. And we think, 
we can work with this. And so we, we grabbed the first mattress, we walked it across the street, just set it up against the front door of some random person's house. We rang the doorbell and we ran away in some hiding spots. After a couple of moments, we see a light turn on, we see the door start to open, we see the mattress gently get tilted to its side only to reveal the largest, most Arnold Schwarzenegger looking person you've ever seen before in your entire life. So Schwarzenegger moves the mattress down, steps out onto the porch, he's looking around, he's very confused, and eventually gives up and he goes back inside. My friends and I did that same thing with the second mattress and then again with the third mattress. Every time, Schwarzenegger gets a little more angry and a little louder. In fact, after that third mattress, he is standing in the middle of the street and he is yelling at the top of his lungs all of the ways he's going to kill us when he finds us. <laughs> then he storms back up the driveway and he slams his door. Here's the problem, guys. There's still one more mattress. <laughs> My mom always taught me, once a job has once begun, never leave it till it's done. <laughs> so we got that fourth mattress and we started walking across the street. We get to the bottom of the steps before we realize we are entering a life or death situation. Remember, we get up those steps. My friend Joel backs away from the mattress. We look at him like, is everything okay? And he gives us these reassuring signs, like, I'm fine, you keep going, I'm gonna go to my spot. So we take all of our attention off of Joel. It was a bad move. Because what we didn't see was my friend Joel back off the mattress, take off his drawstring bag that he was wearing, open it up, pull out a burrito. He chucked it at the door and he sprinted away. That burrito smacked the door and before it hit the ground, the door was open. And there was Schwarzenegger. I was making eye contact with him. Two o'clock in the morning, middle of July, on his porch, holding a mattress, wearing a snowsuit. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you begin to rethink every decision you've ever made in life. But that was one of those moments for me. I, I remember being on that porch and thinking, I don't want to be here right now. This experience that I'm about to have is not going to be fun, it's not going to be pleasant, it's not going to be enjoyable. Man, I have some intense regret about some choices and decisions that led me to this place. And I remember thinking, how in the world did I get here? And then I remember looking around and seeing my friends, and I remember thinking, I got here because of him, I got here because of him, and I got here because of him, and I got here because of him. I mean, the truth is, the force that, that pulled me and put me on that porch that night, it was peer pressure. And what I had to learn over time, the same thing I'm sure you've learned over time, is this, we put it in your notes this way, peer pressure is powerful. I know, for those of us listening, all of us can think of things that we've done situations we've been a part of, choices we've made, things that we've said to people and things that we've said about people that we regret, that we wish were not true of us, that if we could go back and change, we would. And why did we make those decisions? Why were we in those circumstances? It was because of peer pressure. It was because peer pressure is powerful. And now, listen, I get it. I'm the student guy talking about peer pressure. I have seen you, some of you have already like elbowed your son, be like, you're not sleeping for this one. This one's for you. You've slapped your daughter on the leg, like get off your phone. This is gonna be good for you guys. Listen to me. This is gonna be good for us. This is gonna be good for you and for me because the truth is peer pressure is powerful. And that means the people around us, what they talk about, what they post, what they celebrate, what motivates them. Man, all of that stuff has an impact on us. And then here's what else I know is true. The closer the people are, the greater that impact is, the more powerful that peer pressure becomes. You didn't want the new phone because you saw someone on TV with the new phone. You wanted the new phone because your best friend got the new phone. You didn't decide to start paying for lawn care treatments because you thought that'd be a good use of your money. You pulled into your driveway one day and said, this doesn't look good. My neighbor has a better yard than me. I better do something about this. You were fine with your car and your brother came over with a better car. Here's what's true. Peer pressure is powerful. And the closer the people are to, the more powerful that peer pressure becomes. So then when we dig deep into that truth, 
then that means that your inner circle has immense influence. And if peer pressure is powerful, and if the closer the people are, the more powerful that peer pressure becomes, and that means your inner circle has immense influence. And listen to me, parents, I know you know this is true. I know that you have conversations where you call your son up from playing video games and you go, hey, sport, listen. You know that kid? Yeah, the new kid on your soccer team, the one you've been hanging, a lot, uh, hanging around with a lot? I've noticed the more you hang out with him, the more that you act like him on the field. Yeah, you're not gonna hang out with him anymore. You've called your daughter downstairs and you said, princess, you know that new girl that moved in that you've been having sleepovers with? I've noticed that the more you hang out with her, the more your attitude sounds like her attitude. You're not gonna hang out with her anymore. I know you have these conversations because I hang out with your students and they tell me, I hear from six, seven, eight students all the time. My parents said I couldn't hang out with that kid anymore because they're a bad influence. But we're not just protective about our kids when it comes to this stuff. I bet when you met who would be your brother-in-law for the first time at, at the cookout, you saw what he was talking about, his priorities, the jokes he was making, the things that he was celebrating. You thought, I don't like this. This isn't gonna be good for my sister. This isn't gonna be good for our family. I don't like where he could lead them. I bet you had feelings like this when you met your spouse's boss for the first time. And you thought to yourself, man, I hope after five or 10 years of my spouse working for them, they don't begin to act like them. They don't treat people the way they treat people. They're not as materialistic. They're not as greedy. See, we're really good as people at seeing the influence in other people's lives, the influence of other people's inner circles. But are we as good at seeing the influence in our own lives? Because here's what else I know is true. I bet that for some of us, we've left family functions only to break down in the car because we were asked again, when are you guys gonna have a baby? When are you gonna get married? And we feel this pressure or this influence to do something that we don't feel ready yet to do. I bet for some of us, we're just not in a good place financially. We have, we have a significant amount of debt. If we're honest, because the influence in our life at that time told us our degree didn't matter unless it came from that school. So we had to drive that car. So we had to live in this neighborhood and this type of house. I bet that for some of us, when we look back at seasons in our families, we notice some really rocky areas. Why? Because there was some influence in our life that told us we needed to prioritize our career at the expense of our family. I bet for some of us, we wake up every single day fighting an addiction. It's taken our time away from us. It's taken our money away from us. It's hurt ourselves. It's hurt our families. And why is it there? Because at some point in our life, we gave in to some bad influence. And I know for those of us listening, for some of us, we carry around the scars of the places we've been and the things that we've done because of the influence of our inner circle. Maybe some of us feel like we are just now putting the pieces of our life back together Maybe some of us, if we're honest, we look at our life and we go, I'm not in a good spot. Man, I know that the things I'm doing are not okay and where I'm at, is not, I'm not, it's not good. And, and maybe as you're even processing this, you're thinking to yourself, how in the world did I get here? Can I encourage you? Look at your inner circle. Look at your squad. I bet if you did, you could look and say, I'm here because of him. And I'm here because of her. And I'm here because of them because it's true. Your inner circle has immense influence. And this, this isn't a new thing, by the way. Like we've known this for thousands of years. In fact, we're gonna look at something written by a guy named Paul. And if you know about Paul, this is what Paul's life was kind of like. Paul would spend time going to a town and teaching people about Jesus. And then people would believe in Jesus, they'd become Christians, and Paul would kind of form a church with those people and then he'd go do that again at another town, and then another town, and then another town. And he stayed connected to those churches through letters. In fact, a lot of what our New Testament is, it's those letters from Paul to the churches. So Paul did this in a town called Corinth. Preached the gospel, people became believers, he built up a church, and then he left. And then he got some news back that those people were fading away from God. They weren't prioritizing the things of God. They weren't concerned about reaching lost people. They were too concerned about their own social status. So Paul writes a letter. What is the book of 1 Corinthians in our Bible? And in this letter, Paul addresses all of those things. 
And in doing so, he says this, this very simple, very deep statement. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to get them out, open them up or turn them on to the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start reading chapter 15, verse 33. It says this, do not, I'm going to stop us here. They teach you in Bible school that when the Bible starts a sentence with do not, what comes next, we shouldn't do. I just saved you $30,000 in an eight-hour lecture. <laughs> Truthfully, though, Paul's saying, do not. He's saying, okay, listen, warning lights. I'm going to tell you something important. I'm going to tell you something that you need to hear. I want you to lean in. Don't miss this. He says, do not do what? He says, do not be misled. Other versions say, do not be deceived. Why does Paul say this? See, Paul before he gets to what he really wants to get to, feels like he has to say, listen to me, don't believe a lie. Be honest with yourself. Don't be misled. Don't be deceived. Why? Because he knew it was possible that what he was about to say next, people were being deceived about. People weren't believing. People were believing a lie about it. He knew it was possible that what he was gonna say next was gonna cause some tension in the souls of some people, that they were gonna hear it and they were gonna say, well, that's not true for me. That, that might be the case for them, but I'm strong enough. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm the exception. And Paul says, any effort on your part to discredit what I'm about to say next, listen, is evidence that you are being misled. So lean in and heed this warning. Do not be misled. Then he goes on to say, bad company corrupts good character. Ultimately, Paul says, in a very short way, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. When Paul says company, He's talking about your squad. He's talking about your inner circle, the people that you would choose to spend time with, the people that you would spend the most amount of your time with. And he says, it's possible that company could be bad. He says, it's possible that company could be filled with the right people or the wrong people. And then he goes on to say, and the wrong people are gonna take you to the wrong places, but the right people are gonna take you to the right places. They're gonna lead you to good character. And what is good character? And that is us living out what it means to love God and love others. It's us spending time with God and his word. It's us having a healthy prayer life. It's us connecting to church. It's us being a part of a group or serving. It's us being kind to people and patient with people and forgiving people. Us trying to lead people to Jesus. And here's what I think is interesting. Paul says you can have the good character. You can build up the right habits. You can have a solid foundation, but guess what? The wrong people will corrupt that. But the wrong people will destroy those things in your life. Paul says, listen, bad company corrupts good character. Ultimately, Paul is giving them and us a charge for believers. The thing that he really wants them to get out of this, it's the same thing that I really want you to get out of this this weekend. It's this, as believers, we have got to find our few carefully. You have got to find your few carefully. Now, I know, I know that in a talk like this, there are some questions that start to pop up like, so does that mean I, I shouldn't be friends with non-Christians? Does that mean I shouldn't spend any time with them? That person in my life who just reached out to me, I should just ghost them if they don't know Jesus? It's not what I'm saying. In fact, I would say this. If you're looking for examples of how someone who is sold out for God interacts with people who are far from God, look to the person of Jesus. Who is he kind to? Who did he serve? Who do you show love to? Who did he forgive? I'm not saying that you cannot have non-Christians in your life or you can't connect with people who don't believe the same thing that you believe. Here's what I'm saying is your squad though, your squad should be made up of believers. Your squad should be Christians. And, and here's what's interesting. As Paul's saying that, that's not the first time they've heard that. It's not even the first time that's really written in the Bible. If you were here last week, then you heard uh, Keith talk about the book of Proverbs and how it's this book full of wisdom. Well, a couple hundred years before this even, in the book of Proverbs, it tells us this. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. See, Paul's just pulling from this that I'm sure he heard growing up from his parents, that this, if you want to become wise, do you know what you need to do? Hang out with wise people. He goes on to say, do you want to get the end of what being a fool will get you to? You want to suffer those consequences? Hang out with fools. You'll get there. 
ultimately what this is saying is something, a principle we already know to be true, and it's this. Your few is a picture of your future. Man, the, the people that you, would, that you would connect with, the people that you would call your squad, your few, they are a picture of your future. And listen, we know this is true. It's why when we wanna build our vocabulary or our, or our personal library, or we just wanna enjoy reading more, do you know what we do? We join a book club. We hope that time spent with people who love to read, who read a lot of books, time spent with them intentionally, it's gonna rub off on us. It's why when we look at our own bodies and we go, I don't like what I see, we go hire a personal trainer. We hope that with some intentional time spent with them, what we've got will start to look like what they've got. It's why students who study foreign languages find opportunities to study abroad in those countries where the languages are spoken. Because we know that time spent with those people over and over again, that, that language will rub off on them, even subconsciously, that they would be able to speak the language better. We have an understanding as people, man, that our few is a picture of our future. So then what does that mean for us? We have got to find our few carefully. We have got to find our few carefully. And how do we do that? I mean, I mean what are the steps? I think the first one is simple. We just have to heed Paul's warning. We have to make sure we're not being misled. We said it this way in your notes. We have got to be honest. We've got to be honest with the idea that the people around you have influence. You are not the exception. You don't influence them more than they influence you. You can't be the only Christian in your inner circle. Listen to me. The people around you have influence. Do not buy into the lie that they don't. My wife and I, we, we really like to go on trips. In fact, we save money every month into a special bank account so we can go on the type of trips that we like to go on. And last year, we had this trip that we were so excited for. It was a road trip from Ohio to California, and then we flew back. We had all these different stops along the way that we were really pumped for, places we had never been to before, but the one place we were so excited for was the final destination. It was San Francisco. We had been to California before, but we had never been to San Francisco, and we were pumped to do all the things that one does in San Francisco. I also remember we were super excited about the hotel that we had booked. We had found this great hotel online. I mean, the pictures were beautiful, all the amenities you could ever want. The location was right in the middle of all of the action. And we're reading the description, we're looking at the pictures, and we're like, this is going to be gold. We pull up to the hotel, and I realize immediately I had been misled. <laughs> to start, the hotel was above a 7 Eleven. <laughs> so this isn't gonna be a good, this isn't a good first impression. Anyways, we went inside the hotel to the second floor where the office was. We got our code to our room, not a key, a code. I remember going to the room quickly because it was a road trip and I had to go to the bathroom. So I remember typing in the code, I get into the room. There's no bathroom in the room. So I leave my wife in the room because I have to find a bathroom. And I'm looking down the hall and I see these two thin doors right next to each other. One of them just had one single toilet. One of them had a bathtub half full with water, either swim trunks or a Kroger bag, just floating. <laughs> just floating in the water. I, I remember about a minute too late that there was a window next to the toilet that led into somebody else's room. Mm-hmm. And so then I, I am processing now how I'm going to tell my wife, hey, I know it's not in the budget, but we are leaving now. We have got to get out of here. And I remember as I walked back into the room, it didn't take much convincing. <laughs> she was standing in the exact same spot. She was still holding her bags. She had not sat on the bed. She had not put her things down. But here's what's true. We bought into the lie of that advertisement. We bought into the lie that that hotel was selling us. Can I ask you a question? What lie are you buying into when it comes to your friends, when it comes to your influences? Is it that you can be the only Christian in your inner circle? Is it that you, you are strong enough that they don't really influence you? Is it that you can date that boy or that girl that doesn't love Jesus? I mean, you're thinking, Rothen, I can make him a Christian. I can't make him cute. <laughs> what lie are you buying into? Because listen, You've got to be honest. Peer pressure is real. Your inner circle has immense influence. And you have got to believe that so that you can find your few carefully. And the next step, after you're honest with yourself, 
that the people around you actually do have influence is you have to go through a process of what we called ruthless examination. This is the fun part where you get to figure out who is even in your squad. Who are the people that you do spend the most amount of time with? Who are the people that do have influence in your life? And then you have to ask yourself this question, are they the right people? Or are they bad company? See, Apple does this really well. If you're familiar with Apple, the company, I'm sure most of us are, you would say that they do a really good job at creating the right products and staying on top. And one of the reasons why they do this is because of their product strategy. One of the steps is called meticulous attention to detail. I would call it ruthless examination. That's when they take their product and the product of one of their competitors and they ask themselves a series of questions. Those questions are, what are the strengths of these products? What are the weaknesses of these products? What are the opportunities that can come from these products? And then what are the threats that could arise from these products? And by them ruthlessly examining those products and ruthlessly examining the answers to those questions, Apple makes sure that they continue to make the right products and they continue to stay on top. Can I just say, we as Christians, we've got to go through this process of ruthless examination when it comes to our squad. And we have some questions that we have to ask. Our questions look a little bit more like, who are the people that we go to for advice? Whose opinion in my life matters the most? Who's the first person I call when life gets crazy? Who do I try to impress with what I do? Who do I spend the most amount of my time with? And you have to ask yourself the question, why? Why do I go to them? Why do I get advice from them? Why do I share what's going on in my life with them? Is it because they give me the right information? They point me in the right direction? They keep me close to God? Or is it because they make me feel good? They give me permission to do things that I know I shouldn't be doing. So we have to do some ruthless examination to figure out who's actually in our squad, and then we have to do some ruthless examination of those people to figure out, should they be? What's their character like? What are their motivations in life? How are they influencing you? Do they love Jesus? After you're honest with yourself, that people around you, they do have influence, your squad has immense influence, you have to go through this process of ruthless examination. And then once you've done that, in order to find your few carefully, you've got to do this. You've got to act accordingly. Once you're honest with yourself, I'm influenced by my inner circle. The people around me matter. There's such a thing as good company and bad company. After you spend some time figuring that out, do I have good company? Are the people the right people in my life? Then what you have to do is you have to do something about it. You have to act accordingly. I mean, there's one thing uh, that, that I love to do that I spend a lot of time in my life doing. It's whitewater rafting. I don't know if any of you guys have spent time doing that. I used to do it with my dad when I was growing up. I've done it with some friends of mine. I've done it with my wife. Like, I like to whitewater raft. But the truth is, and if you've done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They pump you up beforehand. They give you your gear. You might even watch a little bit of a video to see what it's going to be like. And then you get in a van. And as you're driving down to what will be the launch point, they tell you all the ways you could die white water rafting. <laughs> I don't know. And it ranges from you could fall out or like you could get bit by a venomous snake where we eat lunch. You know, it's a toss up. And so I remember every time, every time uh, they, they do this thing, they go through this whole spiel. And then I remember getting in the boat and thinking to myself, whatever the guy tells me, I'm going to do. And when you're in that boat, you know it's true. There are some stressful situations, and he'll go, you need to go all in. You have to go on the left side. You have to go on the right side. You have to stop paddling. Make sure you go to the right side of that rock. And here's what's true. In those moments when the guide says it, I do it. I act accordingly because I know it's the right information. Listen, someone very wise told me one time, what the Bible says clearly, go and do quickly. This isn't a gray issue. The Bible is saying the people around you matter, that we need to find our few carefully. So what does that mean for you? It means you have to act accordingly. And for some of us, what does that mean? We have to write some thank yous. For some of us, it's an acknowledgement that we have had some great people in our life. They have kept us close to God. They have encouraged us. They have motivated us. They have said hard things to us and they have held us accountable. To those people, you need to call them this week. You need to write them a note. You need to send them a text, take them out for coffee, and you need to say thank you. 
For some of you acting accordingly, you might have to come to terms with the idea that you don't actually have a squad. You're really good at keeping people an arm's length away. You don't let people in. You don't like to be vulnerable with people. Listen to me. We were designed to live life in community. You need a squad. Your job this week then to act accordingly is you gotta find those few. And listen, for some of us, acting accordingly means we need to make a shift. It means that we have to acknowledge that there are people in our squad, listen, who shouldn't be there. And this week, you need to do something about it. And I know, listen, I know you're looking at me like, that is not easy, that's not fair, how can you say that to me? This is what I wanna say. When I say this to your kids, you applaud. I get emails telling me thank you. I'm saying this to you. What you need to do this week, in fact, this is the action step for the week, it's to act accordingly. Send the thank yous. Find those people that you actually can let close into your life or have the hard conversations that you know you need to have. And listen to me, if you're sitting here right now thinking, maybe I just need to pray about it. Or, or maybe I just need to spend more time thinking about it, listen to me. You're just waiting for another way to convince yourself to be deceived again, to be misled again. Don't do that. You need to act accordingly. Because we have to find our few carefully. Now, I've had so many great friends in my life I mean, I mean who, have, who have poured into me and, and who have held me accountable and kept me close to God and said hard things uh, to me that I needed to hear. And there's one friend that kind of sticks out. His name is Joel. It's Joel Fireball. Here's what's true. When Joel came into town, my, my life was in a really weird place. I, I was at a high school where I was brand new. It was freshman year, and I didn't know one kid in my school. <laughs> I didn't know one kid. I remember it was at that same time in my life that my family was really processing some of the most difficult things that we've ever had to process as a family. And I remember because of that, what I really wanted to do was never be at home and always be with my friends. But it was at that same time that all my friends wanted to do was party. They just wanted to drink, they wanted to get high, they wanted to, to go to parties, they wanted to mess around with girls. I didn't want to do that. And it wasn't because I was some great Christian kid. It wasn't because I had good convictions. It was because I saw firsthand what addiction can do to someone, what substance abuse can do to someone. I didn't want that to be true for me. But here's what's true. I needed friends. And my resolve to not do those things was only getting weaker. And then Joel came up. And I remember Joel showed me, you can be a fun high school guy and not be all about partying. To take that a step farther, I remember... Joel taught me I could be a fun high school guy and I could take my faith seriously. Joel, he was two years older than me. I remember him, him pulling me aside one day and saying, can we read through the Bible together? What if we spent time reading the Bible and then we met up and we talked about it? It was the first time that I remember choosing to open the Bible myself and to read it and understand it and apply it. Man, I, I remember my friend Joel went on this trip. It was a seven week long ministry tra training trip that happened in the summertime. I remember he came back from this trip and he said to me, Rothen, you need to go on it. It teaches you how to live a Jesus-centered life. It'd be really good for you. You should do it. I said, Joel, I'm not going to give up my summer. This is when I get to sleep in. It's when I get to do what I want to do. This is the summer that I can actually become captain of my soccer team. And if I'm not here for those first practices, it's not going to work out for me. I can't do that. And Joel said to me, he looked me in the eyes and said, Rothen, how can you tell me you've given Jesus your entire life, but you won't give him this summer? Can I pause for a second? How can you tell me you've given Jesus your entire life, but you won't give him your squad? I remember it was, at, it was on that trip that I remember feeling for maybe even the first time, God was calling me into ministry. And I remember calling up Joel and processing that with him. I remember when I was dating my now wife, Lamaru, and I was thinking, man, I think she's the one. I called up Joel and we had a conversation about that. I remember thinking I might work at a church called Grace. <laughs> and I called up Joel and I had a conversation with him about that. And the truth is, part of the reason why I'm right here doing what I'm doing right now is because of the influence of a faithful friend. Here's what else I know is true. I could have said yes to these friends. And at 10 years ago, when I had the choice between Joel and this other kid, I had no idea that in 10 years with Joel, I would land here. I also have no idea what 10 years with that other group would do. But I can tell you this, I am so glad that I chose Joel. Guys, listen to me. If you are at all trying to figure out, man, who should make up my inner circle? 
What should be the deciding factor? How can I find my few carefully? I wanna say this. Who you choose to journey through life with should be determined by what you're trying to journey towards. And if your goal in life is to live a Jesus-centered life, to be closely connected to God, to be more mature in your faith and to reach lost people, then listen to me, you have to hang out with people who are doing those things. You have got to find your few carefully. Let me pray for us. God in heaven, I, I thank you that you've, you've designed us for community that you've made it so we should live life together and you've made it so that we kind of rub off on each other, that we influence each other and that should be a good thing, but we know it can be a dangerous thing. God, I pray that we would take the warning that we hear in scripture to heart, that we'd be honest with ourselves, that the people around us, gosh, they do have a big influence in our life. God, I pray that we'd go through this process of ruthless examination to figure out, man, who is in our squad and who should be in our squad. And God, I pray as hard as it is, as embarrassing as it could be, as difficult as that step might be, God, that we would act accordingly. God, be with us this week as we go out to find our few carefully. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us first. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.